Hi, I'm Barb. I'm the executive director and the founder of the Barb Smith Suicide Resource and Response Network. We've been caring for the community here in the Great Lakes Bay region, both locally, statewide, and nationwide for over 30 years. What that means is we offer prevention, education, and awareness around mental health and suicide prevention. We also are a resource to connect people to care in the community, and we, we support those who've been impacted by suicide. But it's not really about our network today, but it's about some of our partners that have helped us along the way and how we work together to bring awareness around mental health and suicide prevention. So today I have my guest, Kevin Fisher, who is the executive director of the Michigan National Alliance for Mental Illness. He's also the president of CIT. Um, he sits on the board of commissioners with me for the state of Michigan, where currently we are writing the state plan for suicide prevention. So please welcome my friend, my confidant, and also my fellow advocate for mental health. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you as always. Yeah. So one of the questions, I just kind of give you a whole lot of titles, the, the, the listeners today, but really I'd like you to really elaborate and maybe give us a little more details about some of the work that you're doing and maybe we can focus on each one of those. So like you, I wear many hats. <laughs> uh, my primary hat is as the executive director for NAMI Michigan. For those who are not familiar, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness and we're the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization that's purely dedicated to building better lives for anyone affected by mental illness. So not just individuals who live with a diagnosis, but for their family members, caregivers, and literally the community at large because we know a, one in five Americans are affected by mental illness. That's about 80 million Americans. Wow. So um, large population that is primarily affected by stigma, which I know we're gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. uh, stigma is the leading barrier that prevents people from seeking the help that they need. In addition to my day job at NAMI, <laughs> I am also the president of CIT International. CIT is the acronym for Crisis Intervention Team Training, which was established by NAMI and the Memphis Police Department back in the late 80s, uh, after we discovered, unfortunately, far too many people who were experiencing mental health crisis were coming into physical contact with law enforcement and unfortunately, frankly, being killed in that process. And in saying that, it's not that law enforcement had a malicious intent, they just didn't have the training that they needed to manage people who were experiencing mental health crisis. So CIT was developed in 1988, and um, just this past January, I was elected president of CIT yes. International, so yes. I do that. And then uh, earlier last year, my wife and I established a brand called Everybody Versus Stigma, and that, again, is because we know stigma is the leading barrier that prevents people from seeking the help that they need proactively because everything we do, everything you and I do, is about suicide prevention. And that starts with proactive behavioral health care help. And in addition, as you mentioned before, you and I sit on the Governor's uh, Suicide Prevention Commission. I sit on the state's Mental Health Diversion Council, as well as many other organizations. <laughs> so we stay pretty busy. Yeah, it's almost like you don't show up to a meeting and your hand goes up on your behalf, right? Like, exactly. I'll do it. Exactly. I said earlier, I feel like uh, I was in the old Three Stooges movie, and when they asked for volunteers, uh, Mo and Shemp stepped back, <laughs> and Curly didn't realize it. <laughs> and got volunteered but like you you know I love the work that we do because yeah. we get to help people and that's what it's all about so we're really seeing that shift aren't we from the stigma to now we're talking about it everywhere and many different groups of people yeah we are and you know that's been one of the for lack of a better term, positives that has come out of the pandemic mm -hmm. is more, unfortunately, more people have been affected. People who are living with existing mental health diagnoses, some of those were exacerbated and, and the social distancing caused more problems. But what we also found as with the social distancing, more people were affected, whether it was by depression, anxiety, and some suicidal ideation. So from that we're talking about it more yeah. now it's moving that talk into action and having 
resources available and really making people aware of the resources that are available to them because we also know that while there's never enough we have more resources than most people are aware of and it's how do we connect them to those resources. Yeah. I think that's what we're hearing all around the state, country and locally is people are like, well we have all these services. The problem is we go to use them, most people don't know they're there until they need them mm -hmm. and then when they need them sometimes it's hard to navigate based on insurance and right availability. Exactly and that in its own way provide, causes a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, when you you find out you need behavioral health care services when you're in the midst of a crisis and then when you don't understand how the system works that creates another crisis in the family and I always remind my staff when people reach out to us it is not their best day it's yeah. typically their worst day and so sometimes people call us and they're very frustrated and they're very agitated and we have to try to slow them down and calm them down and let them know we're here to help you. Um, we need some information from you, but we want to be able to connect you with those resources. Yeah. And I think that's the part people don't call us because they're having a good day and their crisis usually is immediate. Yes. And trying to navigate it. So I love the idea of your organization is sort of that, that piece in the middle. Give us the information, your types of insurance, what's the need and then connecting them to other resources locally or statewide. Yes. So they're not the ones trying to make seven, eight, ten calls because you and I both know when they're in crisis and they keep getting a no, we don't take your insurance, there's a wait. It's like that hopelessness just increases. It really does and that's one of the things that makes me so proud to be a part of NAMI and I should say, you know, I'm the state executive but the real work happens in the communities. We currently have 12 local affiliates across the state. We have three more coming online this year. My goal is to make sure every community in the state of Michigan has access to NAMI resources because what we try to do is what I call lower the temperature in the room. When, the, when that family member is in the midst of that crisis, I want to try to calm them and as best we can get you directly connected to the resource so you're not calling number after number after yeah. number and feeling turned away because as you know many times when people are experiencing behavioral health crisis sometimes we only get one chance yeah. because when they get frustrated and they've been told no and we don't take your insurance or you're not sick enough then they start to feel disenfranchised and like nobody cares about them and they say, well, just forget it. I'll go on my own. And that's typically when tragedy strikes. So we try as best we can to connect you to resources so you don't feel like you're being passed around. So I really like, it's like we have that one chance and sometimes that one chance is in within families or the community. Tell us a little bit about NAMI and like what brought you to NAMI? Like what was your previous job and what brought you to NAMI? Because I really, been around a long time, a long time, um, and I didn't know about you till I needed you guys. Yeah. And it's just like, wow, we have such a beautiful people, really at the tips of our fingers, that most people are not aware of. So tell us what NAMI really is, and maybe how you found them. So for me, NAMI is one of the best kept secrets in the country. Mm -hmm. I came to NAMI in 2011, um, and I'll back up a little. My oldest son, Dominique, was diagnosed with serious mental illness in 2007 when he was 20 years old. And he was a sophomore at college, away in school in Ohio, and his mom and I thought he was doing very well. Dominique was literally what I call an all-American kid. Uh, Three-sport athlete, good academic student, great social skills, very little trouble. Um, uh, Dominique was very focused and very driven. Dominique came home for Thanksgiving break in 2007 and just was not himself. He was rambling about taking over the world and God worked for him. And it was just something that his mom and I had never seen in him before. Our first assumption was maybe he went off to school, experimented with drugs, had a bad reaction. So we took him to a local hospital in the metro Detroit area. Um, for drug testing and after a lengthy exam the doctors came out and said there's no drugs or alcohol in the system but we're gonna put him on a 72-hour psych hold 
And for my family, it was like hitting a brick wall at 100 miles an hour. We mm -hmm. never thought mental illness. Uh, the, one of the first questions the doctors asked was, is there a history of mental illness on either sides of our family, which there was not. Um, and that's one of the, uh, I'll call it myths or stigmas that we'll mm -hmm. come back to. But Dominique was initially diagnosed with schizophrenia and shortly after they added the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And that means Dominique experienced some very highs and lows, but Dominique also experienced auditory hallucinations. So he heard voices that weren't there. And we quickly realized how ignorant we were to the behavior healthcare system. We knew nothing about the resources. We really didn't understand his diagnoses. You hear these terms all the time, but what does schizophrenia really mean? What does bipolar disorder really mean? What's he experiencing? How can I help him? What's his life plan gonna look like? And I can best describe it as it felt like the harder I fought, the deeper I sank. There was no continuity to care. Um, there was the difference in do we provide care to him. I was living in Grand Rapids at the time. His mom and I had divorced the year before, so she was living in the greater Detroit area. He was attending the school, uh, school in Cleveland. Where is he going to get care? Where is there going to be consistency and continuity? Um, and that was all very scary, quite frankly. And um, I'll fast forward to say we thought we had gotten a pretty good handle on it. Um, we thought we figured out um, his, what we call proper cocktail of medications because everybody, you and I can be diagnosed with the same mental health disorder, but our treatment plan be very different and our medications we take be very different. And so it's a very lengthy process of trial and error to figure out what's the right medications, what therapy is gonna work best for him. We thought we had gotten it under control and Dominique was doing really well. He started doing so well that two things happened. One, this terrible word called stigma kept creeping up. Dominique didn't want people to know that he was living with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, he literally told me that he felt like a freak and he just didn't want his friends to know. The other thing that happened was he convinced himself that he was doing so well that he didn't need the medication anymore and he didn't need to go to therapy. So Dominique stopped taking his medication. Uh, it wasn't long after that I learned that he had started self-medicating, which is very common, uh, where he was utilizing uh, marijuana and alcohol. And he literally told me one day that the marijuana made the voices go away. And, um, and there's a downside, that's a misnomer. There's some truth and some negatives to that as well. But ultimately, as an adult, Dominique decided that he wanted to manage his own treatment. And three months later, on June 27th of 2010, Dominique quietly dismissed himself from his mom's kitchen and went in the basement and died by suicide. So obviously, you know, losing a child is not a natural act. And where I consider myself to be a pretty resilient person, I lost my dad when I was 15. Um, you know, I'm 57 now, I've lost people along the way and I've always bounced back. But when I lost Dominique, I didn't. And it was a situation, Barb, where I kept waiting for the bounce. You know, I, I kept waiting for, okay, this is gonna be a tough time, but you'll be okay, Kevin. You've been here before, you know, you'll start your life over. I didn't. And about six months after losing Dominique, I literally started planning my own suicide. And I wanna pause for a second for people to understand the myth associated with people who die by suicide or attempt suicide is that we want to die. Nothing is further from the truth. Most people who have attempted and survived a suicide attempt have told us, I never wanted to die. I just wanted to end the pain that I was experiencing, the emotional pain. So that's where I was. I never wanted to die, but I literally told God, if you can't end this pain I'm experiencing, I have to because I can't do this anymore. And I was blessed that on the day that I'd planned my suicide, my wife decided to spend the day with me, which was un 
it, it wasn't normal. Most days, uh, she allowed me to visit Dominique's gravesite alone. And that day, I noticed she wasn't getting dressed for work. And I said, so what are you doing today? And she said, well, I'm going to spend the day with you. And I said, no, today's going to be a bad day. Now, keep in mind, I had gotten up early that morning. I had all my affairs in order. Um, and I had a loaded gun in the small on my back. And I planned to go visit Dominique's gravesite and not come back. But she said, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. I'm not going to allow you to spend today alone. So we went to visit his grave. And, you know, we prayed and cried. And I literally told God, I won't do it today in front of her. But I can always come back. I said, I can come back tomorrow. Um, and I have what I consider a very open relationship with God. And he said, Kevin, you asked me for help and I sent it to you. And all you need to do is take her hand and you'll be okay. So um, we've been married now for 11 years. Uh, my wife is my greatest support. I know you know this because <laughs> Frank has to do the same for you. But um, she also introduced me to NAMI because traditional therapy and grief counseling wasn't working for me and she didn't know I was experiencing suicidal thoughts but she did know me enough and she's intuitive, intuitive enough to know that if I can't help myself through therapy she said well, maybe you can help yourself by helping others mm -hmm. so she introduced me to NAMI and the very first NAMI family to family uh, is actually an education program but for me it became a support group my very first meeting, I felt like I was amongst family and people understood where I was. And that was, I started as a uh, support group member. It wasn't long after that I was invited to be a volunteer board member. And three years later, there was a vacancy for the executive director position. So I took that on an interim basis in April of 2014. And interim has turned into eight, nine years. <laughs> and I love what I do. I get to meet great people like you, and we get to help people. So, so all that pain became purpose, purposeful. Exactly. It does. And, and I often say I don't like the way I got here, but I am blessed to be here because, again, we are able to help people, and we get to see that almost every day. I think that decision... People say, like, somebody chooses suicide, but it's almost like you respond to your pain. Like, I think those are two big words, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, like, and, and, you know, I articulated this way. I said, I didn't choose the fight. The fight chose me. And now I'm in it, and I can't let go. I mean, I have the pleasure of working with you and so many other people across the state. And it is passion. It's not money because, as you and I were joking earlier, we don't get paid for most of what we do. And it's, and it's not about monetary. It's about being a blessing to other people and being able to help people. And to be that voice. Yes. Like, I yeah. mean, think about that shift, Kevin, from where we used to be with stigma to where we're at now. Exactly. To be able to advocate for people. You know, Dominique wanted to be heard. I learned so much from him in that two and a half years where we, we were battling this illness. Um, there's an uh, old temptation song called Soul to Soul. And in the song, the narrative is, I just want to be heard. I'm this book on the shelf that's unread and I want to be heard. And I learned that from him. And I see that consistently when I'm working with people who live with very severe mental illness. They will come to me and say, you're my voice because people won't hear me, but you're speaking for me. And so being an advocate for an underserved community is a huge responsibility, but it's such a privilege and a blessing at the same time. Yeah. And I think it is. It's being that, like, so Dominique really didn't die. Exactly. His voice is just heard through you. And that's what I remind his mom. I said, you know, no matter where I am, as long as there's breath in my body, everybody knows why I do what I do. And I think he would be proud. I really do. Dominique was a people person. He loved taking care of people. And even though while he was in the midst of the illness and the stigma affected him where he didn't want people to know, I think now that he's gone, he would absolutely be disappointed if I did not use his experience to help other people. Because we see that, don't we? A lot of times where someone's grief destroys families. Absolutely. It's self-destruct, right? Absolutely. It is, you know, the grief. It Even when a person is in the midst of 
their mental health crisis, maybe first being diagnosed. I've seen families tore apart because mom and dad don't agree on treatment. Um, one believes in medication, one doesn't. One believes that faith, which is another issue that plays a role, well, we're, we're gonna pray it away, we're gonna turn it over to God, and I'm a person of faith, yeah. um, but I believe in what I call faith plus, but I've literally seen it tear families apart when it didn't need to happen. And again, that's where NAMI has come in for me. I wish I had known about NAMI prior to Dominique's passing, you know, when he was first diagnosed, because it taught me to understand his diagnosis, what he was going through, how I could be a better caregiver, how I could communicate better with him. Because I'm gonna be honest, early on I was awful. I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't understand it. I kept trying to make him be who he was or where I where I thought he should be instead of meeting him where he was and and meeting him at his level. And when we got there, we really started to see more progress. Just it got to be too long for him. Yeah. It got to be too long. Yeah. So what did NAMI teach you? Like what was the most valuable thing that NAMI did for you, but maybe like you said for you, it was too late to meet NAMI. What can what can someone learn from which one of those organizations? Because they have so many programs, which mm -hmm. also amazes me. Mm -hmm. I thought you had like two programs, but I think you have like 10, 12. Well, there's actually 18 oh my gosh. Um, education and support programs, mm -hmm. and they vary by are they for children, are they for adults, um, is it for a person who's living, for example, um, in our own voice, I think is a tremendous program because again, many people who are living with a mental health diagnosis feel invisible or unheard. Where in our own voice helps them craft and to better articulate their story, not necessarily to tell to someone in the public, mm -hmm. but to really tell yourself. It's really hard to accept the diagnosis and it's really hard to put into words how I feel um, about my illness, how I feel about how other people see me. And so In Our Own Voice is, for me, a foundational program for a person who's been recently diagnosed to accept the diagnosis and to find peace with it. Mm -hmm. And then there are other programs like Peer to Peer where people, uh, you actually benefit from working with people who walked in your shoes. You know. I've never been in the military, so it's really hard for me to relate to a combat veteran. And one of the things that I've learned in my journey is vets listen to vets. Law enforcement officers listen to law enforcement officers. Youth want to hear from youth. They don't always want to hear from a dad. Yeah. And so we have to respect that. And NAMI programs allow us to create those lanes where people can be very comfortable, but the, the premier signature program and the one I found the most benefit from is NAMI Family to Family. NAMI Family to Family taught me to understand what the mental health diagnosis is. Again, what Dominique was experiencing really helped me come to grips with how I was feeling. I felt guilty when I said, you know, being a caregiver is exhausting. I just need a weekend. Can he spend time with his mom? Can he spend time somewhere so I can recover that respite? Um, but it also taught me to communicate better and to be a better caregiver. And I really, I often think of how I would have benefited had I had all of this knowledge when he was first diagnosed. So who runs that? Who, when you talk about families to families, who actually facilitates those meetings? It is people with lived experience. Okay. One of the beauty of NAMI is we are 99% volunteer run, wow. and not, of that, 99% of us are all people with lived experience. Either we live with a mental health diagnosis, or we're a family member or caregiver, so we know what we're talking about now. We're not clinicians, you know, we're not doctors and, well, some are actually psychiatrists and social workers, but NAMI has, all of our programs are evidence-based, and all of our program facilitators go through training and they have to be certified. Um, so it's not just anybody who unfortunately has experienced a tragedy 
but doesn't know how to help you bring all of those resources together. Um, and so in addition to being education support, we're also, as we mentioned earlier, the connection. I had somebody from the Department of Health and Human Services tell me years ago, more people seek services at the community mental health offices through NAMI. We are the gateway for more people than through any other medium. And so that's a responsibility that we take very seriously. And it is our local affiliates, that grassroots organization that does the vast majority of that work. So that would be really like key. First of all, you're being heard by someone that gets it, mm -hmm. um, but also that we're not taking the responsibility as a peer person. Yes, you're trained, but when you said evidence-based, some people don't really know what evidence-based is, but that's just highly evaluated mm -hmm. to show that it does work, it mm -hmm. is effective, so it's not just people sitting at a table mm -hmm. and talking, but it's actually some type of a format to move people along and it works? Yes. Um, you know, I tell people, even though I've experienced the tragedy of losing a son, that alone does not qualify me to be a resource to other people. Okay. Um, I can tell you, um, again, lack of a better term, I can tell you a sad story. But at the end of that story, can I help you? And that's what evidence-based is all about. It is our programs have been studied and proven to help people at the end of the day. And that's what's really important. And that's what separates us from a lot of others. I think like that's the key. We're all moving towards that peer to peer, that lived experience. And they just, uh, the federal government put out a study that said 76% of our communities in Michigan do not have enough behavioral health providers. That's appalling to me, number one. Mm -hmm. So if we can train community and family members how to be that first line of defense until we can get them to the professionals, and many people don't even need to go into inpatient psychiatric, right, or exactly. medications. Sometimes if we can learn to care for our own community members and our own family, of course, a lot of people need more help, mm -hmm. right? But I think many times we feel like everyone needs to go to the specialist professionals and we miss that opportunity that's right in front of us. And that's what I like about Families to Families is we can start caring for our own families yep. before we can get them into the service, services that are now really being hard to get into because of the lack of providers. Well, exactly. And to your point, many people live with what we call mod, a mild to moderate mental illnesses, mm -hmm. mild depression, anxiety, those kinds of things, uh, diagnoses. Those are things that you may not need to see a psychiatrist or psychologist for. Those are things many people tell us they just want to be heard. Yeah. You know, it's about finding that comfort in that trusted individual that you can go to and say, this is how I feel. I feel like I've got the weight of the world, whether it is a student who is struggling to perform academically, athletically, and, you know, meet all moms and dads um, criteria. Uh, or someone who's recently lost a job or lost mm -hmm. a loved one. All of those things, most people need to be heard. The next line of defense is our primary care physicians. Can, yes. That can be a resource for us. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy um, at my provider, and this was before I even be, uh, became affiliated with NAMI, you know, when I went in for my annual physical, my doctor would spend the first 15, 20 minutes talking to me about what's going on in your life, Kevin. What are your stressors? Mm -hmm. How are things going on at work? How are the kids? All of those things are the beginning of being able to kind of self-evaluate or mm -hmm. for your primary care physician to be able to evaluate and say, you know, maybe you maybe you're okay if you become a part of a support group and they will make those recommendations. Or you know what, Kevin, maybe we should schedule an appointment with a uh, social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist. Because as you mentioned before, not only in the state of Michigan, nationally, there is a tremendous shortage of behavioral health care professionals. And Barb, I lean to prevention. I mean, everything we do is, I mentioned before, is geared towards suicide prevention. But that work is proactive behavioral health care or self-care. Yeah. It's knowing when you're 
reaching a point that you might be, um, your depression is going on for too long. You know, if it's more than two weeks, then maybe I need to see a professional. Or my, my anxiety is rising at, to a level that I'm not able to manage it. Um, but everything is about proactive because mental illness is a medical diagnosis. So when you think about it, for example, diagnosing cancer at stage one is much better than being diagnosed at stage four. Early diagnosis in mental illness leads to better outcomes. Early diagnosis and treatment leads to better outcomes. So the, when we get past the stigma that we mm -hmm. keep talking about, and we're really able to accept the fact that, you know, I'm not quite myself or my loved one has not quite been themselves. And I can sit down and talk to you as a friend and say, hey, I noticed some change in your behavior. Are you okay? Um, and then we're able to kind of assess that and decide if we need to go further with uh, more serious treatment. That's how we get in the front of this. That's how we eliminate stigma. That's how we prevent suicide. We talked about that a lot in our assist training. It's like we need to stop pulling people out of the river and we need to go upstream to mm -hmm. figure out how can we do better at helping ourselves and quit doing that, pull yourselves up by the bootstraps and yeah. snap out of it. And no one wishes to have depression, anxiety. Like no one wants that. Exactly. If we could snap out of it, we, you know, people probably would do that. Yeah. But they can't. It's similar to someone who has alcohol or substance use. You know, just stop drinking. Well, if they could do that, I imagine most of them would. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody wants to live like that. Yeah. No one wakes up one day and decides, I want to be depressed or I want to live with schizophrenia. Um, and so, again, that gets back to that stigma. And we need to understand, again, mental illness is a medical diagnosis. It is not a personal weakness of character. Yeah. No one makes that decision one day and says, you know what, I'm gonna drop out of life now and I'm gonna let depression overtake my life or anxiety or something else. Most people want help, they just don't know how to ask for it. And it's not a shameful thing. It yeah. shouldn't be. Yeah. It, it absolutely shouldn't be because we're not ashamed to say, I've been diagnosed with diabetes or cancer or heart disease, so why should we be ashamed to say, you know what, I was recently diagnosed with depression and I'm working on it. Yeah, and some things, like I do the analogy, like your brain is an organ just like your eyes. Mm -hmm. If your eyes aren't seeing 2020, you get a prescription, or you do things to help you see better before you get your eyeglasses, you move a little closer, right? We get a bigger <laughs> font in our, in our phones. Like we, we can do things to help us see clearer and mm -hmm. differently. So if your brain is off balance, there, you know, it's okay to do things to just eat well, sleep well, stay away from alcohol, mm -hmm. stay away from the marijuana, mm -hmm. right? Stay away from things that are going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. And then if those things aren't helping enough, then you might need medication. But everyone doesn't need medication. Everyone doesn't need to be hospitalized. Well, I think about mental illness again, very much like any other medical diagnosis. There are medical diagnoses that require hospitalization, mm -hmm. just like there's mental illness that's severe enough that it requires hospitalization. There are illnesses that require medication. There are mental illnesses that require medication. There are certain injuries or illnesses that we deal with through therapy. You go to yeah. physical therapy, same thing with mental illness. You can go to an, uh, therapy and learn how to manage. Um, and there are things that you can do on your own, as you mentioned, healthy diet, sleep, exercise, all of those things to maintain uh, a healthy, balanced lifestyle. You know, I like um, conversation that I had with Senator Stabenow many years ago when we first met, and she says this uh, repeatedly, that we need to have a checkup from the neck up, just as we do from the neck down. Yes, yeah. And unfortunately, the brain is the least studied organ in our body. We need there needs to be more research because we don't know all the causes for mental illness. We don't know what all the triggers are. It's not just hereditary. It's not all just trauma-induced. It's not always substance-induced. There are many, many reasons that we've not identified that trigger mental illness. Uh, but again, we have to eliminate the stigma that it was a personal choice, like a conscious yeah. decision. 
it doesn't work that way. It's so complex. And I think yes. society, right, we wanted to make it fit in this nice box and this is what we have and this is how you treat it, but it's not. It's, it's so multifaceted. Well, that and there's, to your point, there's no silver bullet answer. There's no one mm -hmm. pill you can take uh, to fix it. I was meeting with a gentleman earlier today and we were talking about stigma and he says, well, how do we eliminate it? I wish I had the silver bullet answer <laughs> for that. It is a very complex thing. For me, the best answer that I have is we need to normalize the conversation. It wasn't, and I was using this analogy in the conversation with him. I remember 30, 40 years ago, we didn't talk openly about women having breast cancer. Yeah. Now we celebrate women who talk about it, who proactively uh, take steps to prevent it. Angelina, Angelina Jolie yeah. um, had a proactive double mastectomy because it ran in her family. We celebrated her for that. The LGBTQ community, 15 years ago, people in the LGBTQ community were in the closet. Now, it's literally the reverse. Yeah. Um, if you're anti or if you're homophobic, you have a greater problem than people who live in that community now. Yeah. We need to do the same thing with mental illness and suicide prevention. We have to talk about it to the point that it is a normal part of our daily conversation so no one feels ashamed and stigmatized preventing them from seeking help. Because again, early diagnosis and treatment leads to better outcomes. And that's where we're trying to get. So what would be some signs of depression or mental illness? Like, so you also very close with your wife, but you still didn't mm -hmm. share with her. What are we finding are some signs of that someone might do their own self-evaluation or you know self-assessment what might someone look for in someone else, but also in yourself? So for depression, for example, we all live with depression. Um, we deal with it every day. I always, when I talk to young people, I say, you know, if you're not doing as well in school or if you're not getting playing time on the sports team or, you know, if you didn't get the new iPhone or mom and dad didn't get you that new Corvette you thought you were going <laughs> to get you deserve at 60, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we live with that depression. But if it goes on for two weeks or more, that's a time we need to have an evaluation and say, is this clinical? Is this something that I need treatment for? Some of the early signs can be becoming withdrawal, um, engaging in more risky behavior, a person who, whether young or you know an older adult, uh, may be indulging in drugs and alcohol more than normal. Uh, not finding joy in things that previously brought you joy, whether it was sports, music, dance, yoga, whatever those cap those things might have been, and you don't find uh, joy in that anymore. Um, hanging out with a different crowd, again, maybe more risky behavior. Um, feeling um, excessive lows and highs. Um, feeling that you're a sense of paranoia. Some of those things are our key indicators. You know, one of the things that we miss with Dominique, and it's common and it's overlooked, was a change in his hygiene habits. Um, yeah. Dominique was an athlete, and but Dominique was very particular about his appearance. Um, as an athlete, uh, Dominique would shower two or three times a day because he didn't he didn't want to smell bad. He wasn't uh, one of those sticky ho no, hockey players. No, he was. Like <laughs> no. he opened up their lockers. <laughs> no, I, I tell this joke and, and I say it respectfully. <laughs> Dominique, um, he didn't wear a suit and tie. He wore sweats all the time, but everything had to match. Everything had to look <laughs> nice. Um, one hip, uh, one of the fond memories I have of him is his definition of cross dressing was wearing Adidas and Nike at the same time. He would literally say, Dad, you cannot wear Adidas tennis shoes with Nike sweats. You have to go change. So, but after he was diagnosed, I realized he didn't care. He didn't care about getting his hair cut. He wasn't concerned about grooming. Um, he didn't care about his physical appearance. I would have to remind him of some of the subtle things that we take for granted. You have to brush your teeth every day. You have to make your bed every day. Um, you have to shower every day. Those things became a challenge for him. And little did I know that that was, that was one of the, the symptoms of his illness. Isn't that sad that some, it's like a brain illness can just take so much of yourself? It is. And it, you know, it was so difficult, Barb, to watch him be robbed of who he was. And 
it's more painful to know that he was aware. Dominique was very aware of what was happening to him. And again, I learned so much from him because he would say, Dad, I'm the same person. The old Dominique is still here. You're just not seeing it. And he would literally tell me um, from time to time that he said, I hate for people to talk about me like I'm not in the room. He said, I, I understand what you said. I understand what the doctor just said. Um, in his terms, he said, I'm not an idiot. I'm not any less intelligent than I was before. I might express myself differently. I might be a little more fidgety. I might have these outbursts, but I understand. And, it, and he wanted to be involved in what we call um, self-determination. Okay. Uh, he wanted to be able to decide what his future was gonna look like. He didn't want it to be dictated. He wanted to f go to school. He wanted to have a family. He wanted to be a contributing member of society. Um, and he felt like his voice wasn't being heard anymore. And that was, that was painful. It was pain, I, can, I can't imagine how painful it was for him, but it was really painful for me to watch. I mean, your whole goal and dreams for our kids is to have them live a successful life, quality life, whether it's a star athlete or whatever they are, yeah. as long as you know that my son is living a quality of life. Like, Ex that's every father's dream, right? Exactly. And, and you know, before I learned the term self-determination, it was something that I lived that my father passed on to me. You get out of life what you put in. And Dominique was willing to do the work. Uh, and I have no doubt that he would have been a successful contributing member of society. And, to, and as you just said, we just want our children to be happy. Um, you don't have to be the president. You don't have to be a CEO. Whatever your definition of happiness is, that's what you want for them. And again, to watch him be robbed of that and to be what I call betrayed by his brain was excruciating for me to watch. And when I try to imagine what he was going through, um, to say it's heartbreaking is an understatement. Yeah. We were talking earlier about um, the gene swap, the test. Mm -hmm. Can you, because we talked about wouldn't it have been nice had he had that mm -hmm. early on, right? So it's something new. Can you explain that? So maybe there's a parent that they're frustrated with the system, the medications aren't working, or the individual. I think it's a good hope message that we are shifting. Yes, so in the United States, and unfortunately, again, the pandemic has exacerbated some of these situations. Prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, we said that on average, it took about eight years from the onset of mental illness symptoms to getting an effective treatment plan. But since COVID, that eight years has grown to 11 years. So 11 years on average from the onset of mental illness symptoms to effective treatment. A big part of that is determining what we call the right cocktail of medications for that individual. There's been this excruciating trial and error period of, first of all, what medication is going to work for Kevin versus Barb? And then what dosage works better? And then it, do I need to take this medication in combination with another medication for it to be effective to me, for me, which might be very different for you? So technology is evolving to the point where there's genetic testing available, basically a Q-tip swab that can help scientists better determine what medications will work best for me wow. and what medications would work best for you, cutting down significantly that trial and error period. Uh, and again, it's called genetic testing. There are, are companies here in Michigan and there are a couple across the country that utilize, uh, that make this technology available. Unfortunately, not many people are aware of it. Not only individuals living with mental illness or their caregivers, but there are many professionals, uh, behavioral health professionals who are not aware, and that's our job. That's where mm -hmm. we as advocates come in, is increasing awareness of what resources are available and how to access them. I always, um, again, I have very friendly conversations with Senator Stabenow. <laughs> um, I say stigma is the leading barrier, and then she says, well, awareness of and access to high quality care, and I agree with her. It's just the steps. 
And for me, the steps are we have to overcome stigma and recognize that we need help. And then once we recognize that help is needed, then are we aware of and do we know how to access high quality behavioral health care? And we're going to be celebrating her this coming weekend at the fifth annual NAMI Michigan Honors Gala. Uh, Senator uh, Debbie Stabenow, for those of us who do not know um, her contribution to behavioral health care. Senator Stabenow has her own story, her own family history with mental illness. She is the most outspoken leader on behavioral health care, uh, access to resources and treatment we have in Washington, and she should absolutely be celebrated for that. She and Missouri Senator Roy Blunt, in a bipartisan effort, which is rare uh, given the political climate we live in now, and I'm not gonna get into politics, <laughs> um, but they created something called Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, or CCBHCs. And for the behavioral health care community, that's what we call a game changer because most people struggle with that access to care. And part of that struggle is the severity of my diagnosis, the level of insurance coverage I may have, or my ability to pay. Well, Certified Community Behavioral Health Care Clinics eliminates that challenge. Mm -hmm. And in the state of Michigan now, I believe we have over 40 certified community behavioral health care clinics. And what that means is you can walk into one of those clinics and receive high quality behavioral health care regardless of the severity of your diagnosis, regardless of your insurance status, and regardless of your ability to pay. Because most people don't understand that to receive a behavioral health care treatment through our community mental health system where we have 46 community mental health offices across the state of Michigan. That's our state safety net, but that's a Medicaid um, eligible program, which not everybody's Medicaid eligible. Yeah. Yep. And then sometimes your illness is not severe enough to receive treatment. So you can be turned away. You can be, believe it or not, you can be told, Barb Smith, you're not sick enough for treatment. You have to go somewhere else. And that is the definition of a broken system yeah. that we have to take care of. No one should, no one, when we're talking about prevention yes. all the time, and we know, again, early diagnosis and treatment leads to better outcomes, but we're going to tell you, nope, you're not sick enough. When you're a little more sick, then come back. Yeah. That doesn't work. It's broken. That's very broken. It's broken. And we're working to fix that. And I, I'm one of those people who um, I'm cautiously optimistic and sometimes a little naive. It's not that hard to do. If you get the right people in the room who, yeah. are, who are focused on helping people get the politics out of the way and the money out of the way and just focus on helping people, we can achieve that. We can fix that. I agree. I agree. Do you do we have any of those um, systems here in the Great Lakes? Are you yes, there? Yes, we do. We do. We do. Um, okay. I know, and it's hard. You have to forgive me. It's hard for me to remember all the places across okay. the state. I believe Saginaw Community Mental Health, Genesee Community Mental Health. Um, what's the one out of Mount Pleasant that services this area? Mid Michigan. Uh, Mid -Michigan. Mm -hmm. I believe they are all. Certified okay. Community Behavioral Health Care Clinics. Okay. Uh, if you go on the NAMI Michigan website, we have a list of them because I can't remember them No, all. that's good, though, because then the NAMI website is NAMI.org. It is NAMIMI.org. So okay. it's N-A-M-I-M-I.org. Okay. Or you can call our, our office at 517-485-4049, and my staff will connect you. But Michigan has over 40 certified clinics now. And this program has just been uh, federally funded nationwide. So this is the kind of help that we need. And again, I am, um, I'm so honored that Michigan Senator Stabenow uh, was at the forefront of making this happen. Uh, her, and again, I, I, I can't take credit away from Missouri Senator Roy Blunt because this was a heavy lift. This yeah. wasn't easy to do. This was something they had to fight for. Um, and they were able to get it done in a bipartisan manner, and I could not be more proud of them. 
And I, knowing this work, and I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like checking out a website and what services are out there, what do we not know about, and how can we access them? And even if we can't navigate the system, because sometimes it's hard. Yeah. They can call your office and you have people that will guide you. Well, I was talking again with someone earlier today and I don't know that there's any one individual or organization that houses all of this information, yeah. all of these resources. I try to share as much as I can. I'm sure there's some that I'm not aware mm -hmm. of. Uh, I posted something on social media this weekend about uh, juvenile mental health courts. And one of our premier providers in the Metro uh, Detroit area uh, messaged me back and she said thank you for sharing because I've been doing this for 30 years and I was totally unaware <laughs> that we have juvenile mental health courts yeah. but that's another one of those tools where unfortunately kids act out in school and they're labeled bad kids and they get expelled yeah. or they get sent to alternative ed when the root of the problem is maybe a mental health issue where we can get them the help and and provide them and their families the resources so they can be successful. And these kids who are able to benefit from this juvenile mental health court program are graduating in the top of their classes yes. and going on to live phenomenal lives. And I'm really excited because unfortunately, again, it's one of the best kept secrets in the state and I don't want it to be a secret. Yeah. I want everybody to know about it. And it, it took you to last weekend, or mm -hmm. this weekend that you posted it. And so I feel like we are moving forward on a lot of resources. It's just until you need it, until you put it out there, you know, use our social media to say, hey, is anyone aware of these types of programs? Like a lot of people start to reinvent the wheel. Yes. And I'm not saying NAMI is the do all, like, but I'll tell you, you, your organization across the country is such a wealth of knowledge and information that you have one here in Midland, right? Do you, yes. Is there a NAMI? There's a NAMI affiliate here in Mich uh, Mid Midland. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I just met with uh, the president, Ron Beacom. Okay. Uh, I'll put Ron's name out there. Call him. Uh, okay. He is a tremendous resource. Okay. Um, and admit, again, there are 12 affiliates across the state. There are over 650. Uh, 50 affiliates nationwide okay. and we continue to grow and we just want to be a resource to prevent serious mental illness mm -hmm. and the worst of outcomes suicide yeah. everything we do is about suicide prevention and that's why I enjoy working with organizations uh, like you and so many others um, again I believe in prevention starts with proactive care I struggle with, I see the value in, but I struggle with the message of, if you know someone who's, who is in crisis, call this 800 number. Yeah. I want to prevent you from getting to crisis. Yeah. I want to eliminate that need, and the way we do that is through proactive care and awareness. Yeah. And less people will be needing those services. I mean, not that we don't want it, but the other thing is, is there's so many care services now. Yes. And so you have one in Saginaw, is there, um, Midland. Is there one in Saginaw or Genesee? There is one in Genesee County. We're okay. hoping to reestablish in Saginaw. Okay. Uh, there's one in uh, Grand Traverse County. Uh, we just started a new one in Alpena County. Wow. Um, and so, again, my goal uh, before I retire, and I don't <laughs> know what that word, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that word means anymore. <laughs> but I want to make sure every community in Michigan has access to NAMI resources. So we want to grow the affiliates to make sure that every county has representation, um, and that we're able to connect everyone to the resources they need. Because, as you mentioned, especially once you move north above. I'll say Grand Traverse County, mental health resources are really scarce. Yeah. How we arrive there in this state, I have no idea. It's heartbreaking to go to the UP and realize they have no psychiatrist or they have one psychiatrist that makes a visit once a month. Yeah, um, that is unacceptable. Right. And I'm hoping to continue to work with the Department of Health and Human Services and leg uh, legislature and the administration to change that. Uh, a family should not have to drive eight hours to receive behavioral health care help. It's that's just, just unacceptable. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. totally unacceptable. Not when the services are out there. Like, and I, I'm, I'm all about awareness. I, I think it's important, but 
I think that's more like I'm changing that shift of, yes, we can put billboards up and yes, we can put phone numbers, but let's take that money and train individuals, train communities, have groups like yourself throughout the state of Michigan. So we learn to care for each other. And I really like the program you talked about. Is it, it's my voice? or In, in, my, in, in our my, own voice. In, in our, our own, voice? own voice, yes. Imagine that person that's feeling so alone in their thoughts. And now someone gives them a, a name. They give them a way to talk it through themselves. That in itself to me is hopeful because talking to a person yesterday, he's like, Bart, there's nothing in my mind. I don't understand. Yeah. He said, I feel empty. Here's a brilliant young human being. And so we talked about what it might mean, and it's almost like a little light bulb went on, like, mm -hmm. wow, like you can name it. I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. People get me. I mean, what a beautiful gift that you can give to people. Well, and to your point, you know, many people who live with mental health diagnoses, some who have struggled for years until they receive a name, a diagnosis that this is, this is depression or this is bipolar disorder, they say, now I know what to call it. Yeah. Uh, and so that stigma kind of works in reverse. Uh, many people are looking for not necessarily a label, but they just want to know what to call it. This is why I've been feeling this way. And now that I, it's been identified, now I can deal with it. Yeah. You know, now, now I'm ready to fight. Um, and so that's one of the things that I love about In Our Own Voice is because it gives voice and power to people who sometimes feel voiceless. Yeah. Um, and there's something really powerful about taking ownership and saying, now I know what this is. And again, now I'm ready to face it head on and learn how to manage it so I can go on with my life. This is not going to stop me. Um, it is, you know, some people may think that cliche, but when you're in it, you understand it. Yes and you realize the value in it. So, um, yeah, I, I am a very strong proponent of self-reliance and people not being f made to feel that they're a burden. Uh, one of the things Dominique said to me um, before we lost him was, he said, Dad, I don't want to be a burden to anyone. And no matter how many times I told him, you're never a burden. I signed up to be a parent for life, not for 18 years, mm -hmm. but for life and whatever we need to do together um, to make the best life for you possible, that's what we're going to do. But so many people feel alone and, and so many people say, I just don't, I don't want to be a burden to my family. I don't want to be a burden to society. And that's what leads you down that dark road yeah. to suicide that we want to prevent. And when that families to families, it sort of teaches families how to have that conversation and how to be a support instead of saying, Dominic, you're not a burden. Like, he can't feel it. Exactly. But maybe it teaches you language of how he can feel understood and you can say it in a way that he is feeling heard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the game changer of how do you survive as family or friends or community. Um, I want to go back to, you talked about Debbie Stabenow coming to the the event this Saturday, and it's an annual event, so by the time they hear this um, mm -hmm. like recording today, but I, I think knowing that there is an annual event statewide, that is one of the, I hate to say it's one of the top in the state, right? I don't <laughs> want to brag on you, but when you do, when you do events, you do them pretty big. Um, what is that that's an annual event, and tell us a little bit about it. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, because yeah. we're also going to celebrate you for the tremendous work that you've been doing for mm -hmm. almost 30 years. Um, you are a tremendous resource in this state, and you know I feel very privileged not only to work with you but to call you friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're really excited. But you know we we decided uh, a former board president and I decided about six years ago that people in the behavioral health care space really didn't receive the recognition that's needed. Um, being, whether you're a peer support or a social worker, even psychologist, psychiatrist, it's sometimes such a thankless job. And, um, and these are tremendously passionate people. It's not about the money, it's about the people. So I'm not a big award show person, but I happened to be watching an <laughs> award show, like I said, six years ago, and I said, I wanna celebrate people in this industry. So we we did it not knowing where it was going to lead and it has turned into um, 
honestly, and I, and I say this with humility, I'm one of the premier recognition programs or events in the state. Uh, we've literally sold this one out, I think. Um, wow. And so we will be celebrating you. Senator Stabenow is going to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, there's another gentleman named Ryan Montgomery. Most people don't know his given name because his stage name is Royce to Five Nine, um, who was a Grammy, twice Grammy nominated artist from Detroit, who has his own story of recovery. Uh, and it, he started the Ryan Montgomery Foundation. Uh, and I'm, I, I love the work that he does because his mindset is, and he has a tagline, of bringing privilege to the underprivileged. Mm -hmm. And so I love that about him. So we're gonna celebrate you guys along with 17 other categories that range from uh, volunteers to peer supports to NAMI affiliates that uh, are doing outstanding work um, to psychiatrists and psychologists that are just doing outstanding work in this state. Uh, we get all dressed up in tuxedos and <laughs> evening gowns and this year we're doing it, um, we're calling it a Chucks and Tux event which means you can wear your evening gowns and tuxedos but you can also wear tennis <laughs> shoes. Um, so that's going to be fun. Uh, we also host an annual state conference each year uh, where we bring behavioral health care professionals and family members together to help uh, increase awareness of resources and new technologies like the genetic testing so people are more aware of what resources are available to them. Uh, and that's going to be June 22nd and 23rd in Novi, Michigan oh, this Novi. year. Okay. Um, and then lastly, we host annual walks called NAMI Walks events. And this is a great way for anyone in the community. There's no cost to come get involved, but also learn what resources are available. Because in addition to be a, being a walk and awareness and fundraising event, it's also a health fair. Uh, we invite all of the providers in the area um, who make available all of the information about what they do and where they're located and what services they provide. Um, we've been doing this for 20 years. Um, this will be the second year. The closest one to our community here in Midland is going to be in Traverse City uh, on the grounds of the Commons, which is where the old state hospital used to be. And that will be July 25th. Our largest walk will be held in Detroit on the campus of Wayne State University and that will be September 24th. And then we have one on the west side of the state in Grand Rapids, wow. and that one will be October 9th, I believe, on a Saturday. And it's just a great way to come out and get involved and, and again, uh, learn about more about what's available in terms of resources. And then just to celebrate all of the people who are living with mental health diagnosis and also celebrating the lives of, of the people that we've lost this year. And being a voice, yeah, like, and, right, and, right? Yeah, it's a great advocacy awareness uh, uh, event as well. Mm -hmm. And so everything is about increasing awareness, uh, eliminating stigma, and awareness of resources and how to access those resources so we can prevent loss of life. I always say improve the quality of life yeah. and save lives. Mm -hmm. So you know, last year you were our guest speaker. Mm -hmm. So this Sunday, uh, August 7th, we're again at SPSU, and it really shows a nice partnership. Like you were our guest speaker, and NAMI's gonna be involved this year. Mm -hmm. We hope to have between 1,500 and 2,000 people joining us at SPSU. Awareness event, fundraising, live music, 5K walk run, family friendly. You know, it doesn't always have to be sad and hopeless. It's really, it's hope. It, it really is. Yeah. And I plan to be there uh, uh -huh. again, whether I, you know, I don't need to speak. I like, you know, I love attending events like this because it is hopeful. It yeah. increases hope. Uh, a diagnosis of a mental health disorder is not a di death diagnosis. Yeah. It shouldn't be. We should be able to celebrate life and again eliminate that stigma uh, and live our best possible lives and though these kinds of events allow us to do that. I love being together with you guys because it? it's like the more we work together the better we can care for people that sort of that collaborative care right like it's not one person it's multiple people. And that's what it takes. You know, what's the old saying? It takes a village. Yeah. Um, we're creating that village and being able to connect with organizations like you and many others around the state 
That's what we're trying to do. If as we do that, we normalize this conversation, we eliminate the stigma, we encourage people to seek, uh, seek help if needed, and we create this community of support. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what we're supposed to do as, as just good human beings. And I would love to see anybody, any viewers listening today, to make sure that you support the NAMI here in Midland County. You know, you're sort of breathing new breath into it again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if someone wants to be a nice lead in the Great Lakes Bay region, to get involved, to support, to, you know, be just be that person that shows up. And whether you struggle or not, just show up, be that person that's making a difference. And, and I know, Kevin, it's so important to do awareness, but the reality is, is start doing something about it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like we all, like previous, um, I forgot who had said it, like we all play a role in suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. And we got to stop just talking about it and start acting on it. Exactly. And that's the next step. As you mentioned, it's one thing to raise awareness. It's one thing to have the conversation, but it's something very different to get involved and make a difference. And you can do that as an individual in your home, in your place of worship, in your place of work. Yeah. Um, we need to normalize this conversation. It's easy to get involved, uh, become a volunteer at NAMI. Uh, volunteers are always welcome yeah. and it is whatever your talent is a lot of us and I'll speak for <laughs> myself um, you know I don't know social media very well I don't know technology so um, I'm always excited when young people join <laughs> sure. and, and they can take care of that for yeah. me what takes me hours to do they do on their phones in seconds yeah. um, uh, if you want to become a program facilitator if whatever you want to do if you have one hour or ten hours uh, a month that you can donate we can find something meaningful to do and you can become a part of the solution I would love to do that for a call for action okay. for people in the Great Lakes I know this is where our viewing is today but we all can make a difference and you know you came up from Lansing today you have a full schedule you've got the big event this Saturday you've got walks and I think you have a Zoom meeting with your CEO today. I do. Yeah, and you met with a person who needed you this afternoon. I, I called you, and mm -hmm. um, you connected with a local person who's doing great work, and, and it's like really collaboratively working together. And I want people to help you, and I, I know you're not asking me to say or do this today, but I want people to stand up to the plate and help the, Mid, the Midland yeah. Um, NAMI group because realistically you're the only group in the Great Lakes Bay region that I can refer people to yep. so the more people that we can help grow Midlands chapter mm -hmm. the more the Great Lakes Bay region has hope and extra resources well thank you for that and you know I'm one of those people who I try to be very respectful of people's time yeah. and so I've always worked from the position that I like to ask little of many rather than a lot of a few. Yeah. And so the more of us that take action and get involved, the the lighter the load will be. Yeah. Um, and I did, I met with a great young man, um, uh, uh, Mr. Stamps today uh -huh. from River Jordan. And for those uh, in the listening community who are not aware of this, this is a resource for young people who are in the foster care system and maybe who have aged out of the foster care system who need resources um, because many think about the trauma of going through the foster care system yeah. and feeling like who do I belong to especially when you quote unquote age out yeah. well who do I who, who do I belong to who's my family um, there's depression and anxiety and other serious mental illness that can come from that mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that community feels like they are part of the community. Um, I was blessed that I had a aunt um, in the Saginaw area who was a foster parent for more kids than I can remember. And I was telling Mr. Stamps today, you know, the great thing about that, we would meet these new kids at a family reunion every year. And I was like, well, wait, he wasn't one of your kids last year. And I mean, of course, as a child, I didn't understand foster yeah. care. But what I did understand and what I appreciated about my aunt and her husband was they, as foster parents, they made these children a part of their family. They were a part of the Woodhouse family. They weren't just kids that were, you know, placed there for a period of time and they got some kind of financial benefit. We made them a part of our family. 
and um, and that's needed. So again, I thank you. And this is where the collaboration yeah. comes in, where you reach out to me and say, hey, Kevin, can you contact this person or this organization? Um, because I think there can be a benefit. And we always find that there's a positive benefit that yeah. comes and, and we're able, again, to help each other. I think we're all doing great work. And as always, you know, just appreciating what you do in the community. Is there anything else that, um, do you do you have like a self-assessment on your website that someone can go in or there are others that we could probably discuss? There are others, okay. um, but you can always contact NAMI Michigan at, again, N-A-M-I-M-I.org, okay. and we can connect you with local resources here in the Great Lakes region. Um, I would encourage people, one, let's eliminate the stigma yeah. of mental illness. That is the barrier that prevents people from taking the first step to getting the help that they need. And as you mentioned earlier, not everyone needs clinical help. Many, as a matter of fact, I would say most people just need a friend. Yeah. They just need to be heard. Um, they need somebody that they can talk very openly with. Um, that's the first step for us. And so please be that friend to someone. Ask someone today. There's somebody in your life who you've noticed a change in their behavior and you have a concern with. Pick up the phone and reach out to them or invite them to, uh, for a cup of coffee and just sit down and say, hey, Kevin, I'm concerned about you. Can I help you? Can I be there for you? So simple sometimes. If yeah. We make it too big. Exactly. Yeah. There's a website um, where our network is part of a PRISM grant mm -hmm. for one of the community partners, which is preventing suicide in Michigan men, mm -hmm. because men have a higher rate of mm -hmm. suicide right now than the national average. Mm -hmm. and, and that mantherapy.org is one of the websites that really has some great information that if you're struggling yourself or you know of a, a gentleman that's struggling, you know, whatever the age group is, is you can go online and do that self-assessment and then mm -hmm. click on local resources. But um, there's so many valuable websites out there right now. Just make that call, yes. right, and just connect to another human being so you don't have to walk this, you know, struggling life alone. And that's why the rates of suicide went down during the first year of COVID. And even people seeking mental health treatment the first year was less than year two. Exactly. Because why was that? Like, what did we figure that? It was, it, it was that connection we had to make yeah. because we couldn't we couldn't uh, interact in person yeah. so we had to find another way and and we accepted the call uh, to call and check on each other yeah and so we had to do more I remember that like it was hard for us speakers and advocates like our world stop it was like this wall mm -hmm. like we were speaking 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 and doing all this work and then we got like nope everything's canceled and like yeah. I remember sitting on the couch and going like now what? Yeah. Like, now what? Who do I talk to? And it was interesting. And I remember it was like, oh, I don't know, two weeks later, I think we called and checked in on each other. Mm -hmm. And just how, like, how's it going for you? And I'm like, I don't, like, we didn't even know. Yeah. Like, it was so overwhelming to people that, but I, I mean, we did a self-check for each other mm -hmm. even. Like, like, how are you really doing? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's what we have to do. Don't accept the passive, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Yeah. No, how are you really? Yeah. How are you managing your day? Because as you mentioned, our world, we're so used to being busy and out on the road and yeah. it just came to a stop. And it's, yeah. okay, now what do I do? And, you know, uh, when we were self-isolating and yeah. you're there with your spouse and your kids yeah. all day, and that was a challenge for many, many people. Yeah. How do I manage that? Because I didn't, I wasn't used to having the kids at home all day. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. used to being at home and, and uh, sharing space with your spouse all day. Yeah. Um, and so it was a, it was a learning <laughs> yeah, for all of us. People were in my <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where did it come from? It, yeah, it was, it was a learning. And, you know, um, for my wife and I, and again, she has been such a blessing to me, we would sit down uh, at the dinner table every day and go over our schedules for the next day to say, okay, you've got, because Zoom took over our lives. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I have eight Zoom meetings today. I will take mine in the basement. You take yours in the <laughs> office or whatever the case may be. But but we had to learn to, to navigate that. And um, mm -hmm. for us, it was really beneficial. Yeah. So For myself as well. Started yeah. to play some card games and board games. And, you know, our grandkids are out of town. And we would read books to, like, mm -hmm. to the grandkids. I'm like, wow, why don't we do this always? Well, we learned technology. My mom's 90. 
now and you know everybody went to zoom holidays and zoom christmas yeah. well my mom's not she didn't want to learn new technology yeah. so we learned to take advantage of other um uh, technology available in particular the well the amazon echo uh, devices where she could just say alexa call kevin but it wasn't just audio it was video oh, so yeah. she got to meet her new great grandchildren through you know yeah. this video document because she couldn't see them in person uh, for two years so so um, we learned a lot of things and i think you know people talk about a lot of trauma through covid and i think legitimately a lot of people do have trauma mm -hmm. but i don't feel like i do i feel like i've become more resilient did you know there's a word in the dictionary called flexibility exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i didn't even know that word exists i'm like what yeah. does that mean right and but we had to learn that stop and breathe and look at our own families and it, everything isn't always going to be this way and, yeah right yeah. creative the, um you know they say the one constant is change and I'm really proud of my NAMI affiliates because many organizations, and I'm sure yours, we had to move from in-person to virtual platforms for yeah. everything. And how do you host a support group um, virtually? And you know how. And I'm so proud because they adapted very quickly. Yeah. Um, and and so yeah, COVID. You know, there's a lot of obviously negative. We lost a lot of people yes. uh, to COVID. But we learned a lot too, and, and as you mentioned, we learned flexibility, we learned adaptability, um, we learned that we can navigate um, if we just sit down and think about it. You know, take a step back and breathe, yeah. and say, "Okay, here's the goal. How do we get there?" Yeah. And I'm I'm really proud because people tend to be more resilient than they are aware of. Yeah, we just have to give them an opportunity. And I think together we're all making a huge difference. And I, I know sitting on the governor's commission, Kevin, just it's such an honor to work with such caring people at that state level and, you know, putting our minds together and our hearts and our passion. And it feels like it was slow, mm -hmm. right? At year two, I'm like, okay, let's get this going. And But the reality is we are moving. And I want people to know that are listening today, there's a lot of hope out there, but a small group of people can't do it. Yeah. We need everybody doing this. and educators are so overworked and mm -hmm. law enforcement and you know behavioral health specialists and you know our primary care and all of us people doing a lot of the work that we need everyone to work together and stop pointing fingers be hopeful the gene testing i mean we've got great things happening in this country and even in our great lakes community so exactly and again to your point it's it's about collaboration yep. Um, it's about getting in the room together and not focusing on our differences. I've learned that when we start with where we agree, yeah. it's a lot more easy to deal with those issues that we maybe don't agree on when we walk in the room. People tend to deal with the problems first. I like to say, where's our common ground? Where, where, do we, where are we okay? And then, okay, you and I may not be quite together on this issue, but how can we get closer? Because we tend to find out we're not as far apart as we thought. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it's about that connection and having that conversation and that willingness to be open um, and to be respectful of each other's views. You know, one of the things that I've learned is one, I don't have all the answers. I've always known that. I've always been very open about that. But to be able to accept seeing the world through the lens of somebody else and to be able to say, you know, I never thought about it that way before. I've only looked at it this way because this has been my experience. Mm -hmm. But yours is different. And so I quickly learned that, you know what? Now that I hear you say it, I don't disagree as much as I thought. It's not a hard no. Yeah. It's uh well, let's walk this back a little bit. And okay, that does make sense or that's a different way to see it. So again, now how do we get to the solution? And those solutions come a lot easier and more quickly when we're able to do that. And and that's the power of the Suicide Prevention Commission, the Mental Health Diversion Council, and all of those other organizations we're a part of, it's all about collaboration. And it's all about respect and willingness to be open, um, not only to speak, but to listen. Yeah. 
um, and realize we're all in this thing together. And it sounds cliche, I yeah. know to some people, but that's the reality. We're all in this together. We're all about improving the quality of and saving lives. That's something, I haven't met anybody yet that we disagree yeah. on <laughs> that's that. Common, that's our common goal. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'd like to say thank you for spending this time and your busy schedule and really bringing a, a NAMI to a whole nother level right here in the Great Lakes Bay region. Um, that call to action is to have our listeners to really um, join in on this force and to be together with us. Don't forget the NAMI website. It's N-A-M-I. MI.org exactly. and a wealth of knowledge, a lot of resources. So don't do this uh, journey alone, but know there's resources right here in our community. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.